This video is supported by Brilliant.org. As I've said many times on this channel, we are entering an exciting new era of space travel, a whole new space race with private flight companies. And today I thought it'd be interesting to talk about space stations. Uh, and what's cool about space stations is, you know, they serve as a place where astronauts can hang out and make observations of the Earth, perform experiments on uh, long-term space travel, and, and learn about how to do things in zero gravity and microgravity and weightlessness, and they can examine, you know, repair and maintenance procedures that can uh, affect the parabola of the trajectory of the hypotenuse and other... <laughs> Ow. Okay, it's not the most exciting subject. Compared with launches and propulsive landings and starships and dragons, yeah, a floating collection of tin cans in space doesn't really inspire the tingles. But it's more interesting than all that. For example, did you know that there's actually three space stations in space right now? Oh, well, hello, Mr. Asterisk. What could you possibly mean? Two of them are actually unoccupied prototypes from Bigelow Aerospace, the Galaxy 1 and Galaxy 2. They were launched in 2006, 2007, respectively. They only actually were operational for a couple of years, but they're still floating around up there, and NASA's using them to kind of examine the viability of expandable stations. But of course, when it comes to inhabited space stations, the ISS is the big dog. In fact, it's the only dog. The very lonely dog. There are a handful of other long-term space stations that have graced our skies, including the Skylab and Salyut programs of the 70s and 80s, and Mir in the 90s. In fact, the success of the ISS owes a lot to the Russian space station programs that they, you know, doubled down on while the U.S. was doing the moon thing. But each of these programs taught us important lessons about living and working in space, which is important stuff that we're going to have to know how to do if we're ever going to set up any kind of permanent presence outside of Earth. And the thing about living is, it takes time. You know, while the orgy of exploration that happened in the 60s when we went to the moon was exciting, it wasn't sustainable. Achieving sustainability in space requires long-term living and working up there, solving little problem after little problem over and over again until you get it down. And after 20 years, NASA's ready to finally put up a new space station. But this one has a twist. This one is going around the moon, and it's going to do a whole lot more than just house astronauts. It's called the Lunar Orbital Platform Gateway, and it's meant to serve not only as a way station between Earth and lunar bases, but also to Mars and beyond. It's also got a banging album on Spotify. The main purpose of LOG, and really any long-term lunar mission, is to learn how to live outside of the Earth's magnetosphere. Our magnetic shield protects us from a huge amount of solar and cosmic radiation, and how that radiation will affect us when we move outside of that is a huge question mark. That and a million other question marks. And as much as we all want to get to Mars, the fact of the matter is, people on Mars are going to be completely on their own. If something goes wrong, there's no way to help them out. So you can think of lunar missions as a big testing ground for Mars colonization, where any you know, mistakes that are taking place you know, on the moon, there's help relatively close by, especially if there's some kind of infrastructure between the Earth and the moon. And that's where LOB-G comes in. LOB-G is part of the Artemis program, which is NASA's mission to land and stay on the moon by 2024. Artemis being the Greek goddess of the moon and the sister of Apollo. And the plan for Artemis looks something like this. Artemis 1 will be an uncrewed flight around the moon with the Orion capsule from the SLS. This will test the Orion capsule systems and the SLS, and along the way it'll drop 13 satellites to gather data for additional missions. This is planned for this year, 2020. Fingers crossed. In 2022, Artemis 2 is scheduled to go up. This will basically be similar to Artemis 1, only this one will carry four crew members around the moon, much like Apollo 8 went around the moon first before we landed. And Artemis 3 is when we finally land humans on the moon again. This is scheduled for 2024, and after that, pending success and budget allowances, NASA plans to launch astronauts to the moon once a year following that. These regular launches will bring habitats and resources to the moon to set up a permanent moon base. A permanent moon base serviced by an ever-present lunar space station. LOB-G will be comprised of seven to eight modules, including a propulsion and power module, a couple of habitation modules, an airlock, storage, and a logistics and utilization module along with the Orion capsule. It's much smaller than the ISS, closer in size to the Mir space station, and it's made to house up to four people. But, like the ISS, it's an international project involving modules from ESA, JAXA, Roscosmos, and of course, Canada providing the robotic arm. Because Canada is all about the robotic arm, eh? To help offset the cost of the program even more, NASA is working with 11 private companies to build and service the station, including SpaceX and Blue Origin, with their Blue Moon lander. These companies will be involved in landing, providing fuel and resources, rovers, and other science experiments as well. 
The point is, if we're going to stay on the moon, we need some kind of pipeline of resources to support it, some kind of infrastructure. That's what LOPG is designed to do. Flights will come from Earth and rendezvous with the station. From there, astronauts will be able to refuel or drop off materials, and then getting to the surface of the moon is simple as crawling into a lander and popping down to the surface. When it's time to go back home, you just boost up to the station, move over into the Ryan capsule, and head back home. It's like the moon's valet service. It's all right there in the name, Lunar Orbital Platform. It'll serve as a platform to coordinate the transfer of astronauts from a space environment to a lunar environment. Now the second half of the name, the gateway part, well for that we're gonna have to talk just a little bit about orbits. And I do mean a little bit because a lot of this is way over my head and not a little bit over my head either, like, like GTO. The nerds get that one. Have you ever noticed how almost all launches launch along an eastward trajectory? That's because when it comes to spaceflight, any amount of velocity you can get your hands on, you need to take advantage of. And the Earth rotates in an eastwardly direction, so if you could take off around the equator, you could get 1,038 miles per hour velocity right off the bat. Which is also why most launch facilities are closer to the equator where the Earth spins the fastest. So with that in mind, look at the moon. It's out there, reflecting light, making werewolves, orbiting the Earth at 2,288 miles an hour. And if you were going to travel out to Mars or beyond, that's a lot of velocity you could use. So a way station orbiting around the moon would not only give you that velocity from the moon, but the velocity of the station orbiting around it. And this has been the idea behind the Lunar Gateway concept for a long time now, to use all those velocities to slingshot a craft out into deep space like a giant space trebuchet. Plus, the gravity well of the moon is way less than the gravity well of the Earth, so you would have a lot less energy expended just to get outside of that gravity well, as Joe from It's Okay to Be Smart covered in a recent video. Now granted, you still have to escape the gravity well of Earth in order to get to the moon, but if we were able to make fuel on the moon in situ, then we could refuel and orbit around the moon, have that extra velocity and a full tank of gas on the way out to Mars. So yeah, LOPG kills two birds with one stone. It serves as both a lunar platform and as a gateway to deep space, hence the two-part name. So now that we've got the rationale behind LOPG, let's just uh, take a look at the cold hard numbers here. Some estimates have put the cost of the Artemis program to be around $150 billion, which ironically is about exactly what the Apollo program would have cost when adjusted for inflation. That's according to an article that I'll link below. There's actually a lot of projections at this point. It's going to require four SLS launches to assemble 400 tons of modules and equipment up there in order to create LOPG. And just to put that into perspective, it would take 20 Falcon 9 launches to put that much up there. That just gives you an idea of how powerful the SLS actually is. Now the downside of the SLS is, of course, it, it doesn't currently exist. And there will be a lot of things to figure out along the way. For example, we've never assembled any kind of spacecraft around another celestial body before, so we can expect some delays in this whole process. But the upside is, um, all this stuff is stuff that we're gonna have to do when we go out to Mars anyway. So once again, it's a matter of figuring it out here first. And one of the things we'll be figuring out is the orbit, which is super weird. You know, while the ISS just kind of skims along the outside of the Earth's atmosphere in a circular orbit, LOPG, is gonna be doing something very different. LOPG's orbit is elongated, extending out thousands of kilometers from the moon, making the astronauts on board the furthest distance any human has traveled from Earth before. Far enough away that they'll be able to have the first view of all of the moon and all of the Earth at the same time. It's called the Near Rectilinear Halo Orbit, or NRHO. And it doesn't just orbit in an extreme ellipse, it also twists into a butterfly shape using the EML1 and EML2 Lagrange points to keep it stable. Lagrange points are areas where the moon and the Earth's gravity kind of even out. Orbiting this way will save a lot of fuel over time, plus it'll provide a little extra oomph for those deep space missions that I was talking about, and it will make it so that the station is never behind the moon and out of communication with the Earth. Construction on LOPG is scheduled to begin in 2022, about the same time as the Artemis II mission. The first launch will put out the power and propulsion module, followed in 2024 with crew habitats that'll be happening at about the same time as the crewed landings on the moon. And after that, it's planned to launch new equipment every year until it's finished in 2026. Now, I know what many of you out there are thinking right now. You're thinking, 2026? What about Starship? To which my response is... I mean, yeah. If SpaceX is able to do everything that they plan to do with the Starship and make it land on the moon and be totally reusable and everything, does that make the orbital platform obsolete? 
And yes, that's an interesting question, and there are a lot of ifs in that statement, but basically what it comes down to is anything that lands on the moon at this point is, is going to have to be reusable. In the Apollo days, the lunar lander was completely expendable. In fact, it was made up of two different stages, a descent stage and an ascent stage. The descent stage sta stayed on the moon, and the ascent stage you know, went up and recombined with the command module, and then that was eventually discarded as well. Now, if we're really going to be setting up a permanent base on the moon, we can't just be leaving half of the lander behind every single time we land. The place would become overrun with landing legs. So it'll have to be reusable. And it's not an unfair question to ask, like, what's the point of that if we have a ship at that time that's actually got more room in it and can land and be completely reusable as much as we want. And the fact is, this idea does have its detractors. The list of detractors includes former astronauts like Commander Terry Virts, Commander Eileen Collins, and the one and only Buzz Aldrin. Robert Zubrin from the Mars Society and space journalist Ethan Siegel disagree with the space station strategy, saying we should just simply put a reusable lander in orbit around the moon and it would do the same thing. This station is not an asset. It is a liability. The general consensus among them is that it's too big, it's too expensive, and it's too distracting from what we should be spending our resources on, which is moon bases. The SLS for all its power, is going to cost $2 billion per launch, and every single piece of it gets thrown away after one launch. You know, at a time when SpaceX and Blue Origin are both reusing rockets and both have plans for reusable Saturn V-sized rockets on the way, it kind of feels like the whole paradigm has shifted a little. Is this entire program out of date? Or could it possibly evolve to become more reusable because they are going to be working with private companies who are already working on the renewable stuff? Could it actually benefit the Artemis program in that way? Or will they just bypass it altogether? Or maybe there's an argument to be made that, again, it's worth doing all this stuff here around the moon so that when we get to Mars, we'll have all this technology perfected by the time we get there. Like, maybe we'd be doing ourselves a huge disservice by not doing that. So I'll bounce this on to you. What do you think of Lob G? Do you think it's a sound investment? Do you think it's a good strategy? Or like me, are you just happy to be seeing something happening finally? Debate it in the comments. And if the orbital mechanics stuff that I brought up in this video gives you a headache, you might want to try taking an ibuprofen. And when you're done with that, maybe check out the classical mechanics course on brilliant.org. This course will take you from the basics of a swinging pendulum through conservation of energy to the rocket equation all the way to Einstein's theory of relativity. It'll take you step by step, learning one piece at a time, until the next thing you know, you're an expert on orbital dynamics. And that's how Brilliant do. They teach you through problem solving with interactive puzzles and games to help you figure out the solution in the way that makes the most sense to you, so you can apply that to other areas of your life. And this is just one of, what, 60, 70 courses that they've got right now? I can't even keep track anymore. And they have offline downloading, so you can take it offline and flex your brain cells wherever you might be. Plus, they have daily challenges and kind of help you get into a daily learning habit. They're a lot of fun. They have free weekly puzzles that you can solve that you don't have to sign up for. But if you go there to brilliant.org slash answers with Joe and you try out those weekly puzzles, decide you like them and you want to sign up for the premium subscription, you can get 20% off your subscription for life. You know, it's the beginning of the year. It's a great time to start a new learning habit. And if Brilliant is something you've been thinking about for a long time, now is the time to check them out. So brilliant.org slash answers with Joe. Links down in the description. Big thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video and a huge shout out to my answer files on Patreon that are supporting this channel, growing a cool community. I can't thank you guys enough. There are some new people who have just joined. And by the way, there's a lot of them here. This is going to take a minute. I kind of took a few weeks off, so bear with me. <laughs> We've got uh, Dizzy, Warhawk, me, Panakoek, uh, Stephen Harville, Max Gare, uh, David Noonan, Ryan M. Rothmark, Danger Noodle, Micah Holland, Per Herland, I think. Uh, Paul Mazzola, Alistair Cook, hey Ali, uh, Paul Kretz, Greg Easterly, Guy Hollington, Jason, Kyle Kramer, John Clements, and Gordon Bundy. Thank you guys so much. If you'd like to join them, get access to early access to videos and access to me and the whole community and do the whole thing, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. T-shirts is always available at the store, answerswithjoe.com slash store. This is uh, appropriate for this video because it's like going from Earth to the moon to Mars. See how that works? See? Huh? Lot G, y'all. Uh, you can find these and many others at answerswithjoe.com slash store. Lots of other stuff, hoodies, mugs, uh, posters, stickers, have at it. So yeah, please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, you've never seen any of my videos before, maybe check out some of the others that are linked down there. Google thinks you'll like this one. And if you do like the kind of stuff that I do, I do invite you to subscribe. Come back with videos every Monday and every Thursday. All right, that's it for now. Thanks again for watching you guys. Go out now, have an eye-opening rest of the week, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.